Welcome to our next Revival History course. I've got to say there's something special on this story. As we prepared, did the research, and just prayed into this, God began to grip us with a fresh sense of faith and hope. I just believe there's something unique in the story for the hour that we're in right now. So hang on, grab a hold of this, let God just fill you with fresh faith and fresh expectation right now, and expect Him to plant a seed of revelation deep in your heart that would lead to something profound as we jump into this story. Now, before we get into the details of it, I want to give you two threads to look for in the story. They're, they're common themes in this particular story, but I'm wondering and I feel these might be two of the things that God is speaking to tens of thousands of people across the world. Number one, we see in the Welsh Revival and the life of Evan Roberts and some of those we're going to be talking about is a simple phrase, infatigable hope, a hope that never gives up, a hope that never grows weary, and a hope that isn't based on what we see in the circumstances around us, but a hope that is based in the word of the Lord. Number two, we're going to see in this story particularly the importance of crossing a line of conviction on the word of the Lord and a personal coming out of comfort or passivity or hesitation to believe God and take action based on his word. Evan Roberts is one of the key catalysts to the Welsh Revival. Um, the, the beginnings of the revival in the early 1900s, but let's just rewind for a moment into the late 1800s. Evan Roberts is 13 years old when he gets gripped by a, the power of God. Almost unexplainable. He's 13 years old and he's got a passion to study the Bible and he's got a passion to pray. He's working in the coal mines, even as a young boy, but all of his free time begins to be spent going after God. Now, fast forward into the early 1900s, he's now in his mid-20s, and he is getting gripped, not just with a vibrant devotional life, which is incredible, and that is success, but beyond the devotional life, now Evan begins to get gripped with the cause that's on God's heart for Wales. He is getting consumed, believing that now is the time for revival in Wales. He's crossing a line of conviction, and he's gaining a hope that is infatigable, that his circumstances and the world around him can't steal from him. He's beginning to believe the word of the Lord more than empty churches or dull prayer meetings that he sees in the spiritual activity of Wales. He's beginning to carry a faith that's stronger than people filling bars or domestic violence of his day or the, the people that are just not interested in God. He's beginning to hear a different report from heaven and that sound is growing louder than all the sound of the world around him. The spring of 1904 would become a critical time in this history. I'm just going to slow down and take you into two moments of crossing the line to see how the impact and the implications, the ripple effects of these moments shaped history. I want to take you first to the north coast of Wales, a little tiny town called New Quay. I was there myself years ago and I was looking in the window of this old chapel, um, just trying to see what was in there. I, I didn't know that there was any real revival history connected with this chapel, but I was just interested in everything that happened in Wales. As I'm looking through the window, an older woman walks up to me and she says, do you want me to tell you what happened in that chapel? I was like, unbelievable. Like, did the Holy Spirit cue this lady? And she, she all of a sudden wants to tell me the revival story. That's the whole reason I'm there. And I didn't even know there was a revival story. She pulls out one of those old skeleton keys and she unlocks this ancient door. And she takes me into this little tiny kind of boring, you know, plain chapel. And she takes me in this like side room that she says, this is where the youth met. And she says, let, let me tell you the story of what happened in this room. One of the few revival preachers, there were a handful of them beginning to travel around Wales that had this seed of hope, like I talked about, that Evan Roberts had. One of those preachers comes to New Key and is speaking to the youth of this little chapel, calling them into spiritual awakening, declaring that he believes that revival is coming to Wales. And he gives an opportunity for people to testify and respond. And she tells me no one's responding. She says it's like this awkward response, prayer meeting. The guy's like full of faith and passion. And he kind of you know, rolls out the carpet and makes the call. You've been there, I've been there. And no one says anything. What do you do? These are frustrating moments when you carry a burden for revival. And in the silence, all of a sudden, this young girl, 14, 15 years old, Flory Evans, she stands up among her peers 
and she makes a simple declaration, I love Jesus with all my heart. And she said, this older woman said, when she said that, it was like the power of God opened up over this little room and all these teenagers begin to fall on their faces, repenting of their sins, confessing things that nobody knew, crying out to God for forgiveness, for mercy. And it was like revival hit this little group of high schoolers because one young girl crossed a line in her convictions. And and that that said of this moment, is that that was like throwing gasoline on all these little sparks that were, you know, God had already put in the hearts of people across Wales, but there was no action yet. There was no, nothing visible. They were carrying it in their hearts. But this declaration of Flory Evans and this moment in that chapel was like throwing gasoline and those little sparks soon grew to raging flames across the nation. Unbelievable. I want to take you to a second moment. We're still in the spring of 1904. Evan Roberts is uh, pressing into God in this place of prayer. As I said, he's mid-20s now. He's been faithful for over a decade, but something shifts in his life. And he goes into a season of several weeks of encounters with God that he described as indescribable. He had no words. In fact, his family would see him go into these encounters with God and he would tremble so much that they were concerned for his health. They thought something was happening to him. But when he would begin to explain to them after the encounter that, no, this was God, and they would say, describe to us what's happening. He'd say, I can't. There are no words. It's indescribable. These encounters were so real. We've got to have faith and expectation that God wants to meet us like this again. Because it was these encounters that Evan Roberts, caused Evan Roberts to cross a line in his own life from faithfulness and a burden for revival to being absolutely consumed with the cause of revival, with the cause of Jesus being made famous in Wales and being worshipped once again in the churches of his nation. It's in that season he becomes so convinced that revival is coming to Wales, that no one could talk him out of it. And in fact, in that season, he's so gripped, he begins to pray a simple prayer. God, a hundred thousand salvations in Wales. Give me a hundred thousand salvation in Wales as you pour out your spirit. That prayer would be even more than answered in the months to come. Evan Roberts had crossed another line in his life. He had had such profound encounters that he went from radical and faithful to consumed, wholehearted in the word of the Lord. Fast forward to one other moment, catalytic in Evan Roberts' life. This is now in September of that same year. He's in a chapel, another one that I stumbled on when I was in Wales. And he's hearing a message of one of these guys who's carrying the burden for revival and Evan Roberts is crossed a line. He's all in. And that man says a sentence, he talks about Wales and the need that, that for Wales to be bent to God, that God would bend Wales back towards him, towards obedience, towards wholeheartedness. And that word, like, it was like electricity for Evan. It hit him with such faith, going, that's it, that's the phrase. They met together that, later that night, they were in a kind of a prayer meeting, and Evan Roberts He can't handle it any longer. He stands up and I saw the little plaque that marks the place where he stood and I stood in that same place. And Evan Roberts stood up in the midst of the congregation, the assembly, and he starts shouting with all of his heart, bend us, O God, bend me, O God, bend us, O God. And this little phrase would become the watchword of the Welsh revival. Fast forward now to kind of a final moment. And uh, I I just wanna, I I wanna take you into a week or, or 10 days that forever changed human history. And even as we go through this, just briefly, not too much detail, is that we would gain faith for what God can do in 10 days, for what God can do in a week, for what God can do in a moment. When God breaks in, everything changes. November 1st, Evan Roberts goes back to his hometown, Mariah Chapel, and uh, he has the sense that now is the time and that he's to go home and that's where the revival is going to start. When he gets home, his mom says, why have you come? There's nothing here for you. And he says to her, I'd rather be the biggest fool in Wales than than miss out on what God has. And on November 1st, he has his first opportunity. It's just a normal Tuesday. I think it was a prayer meeting that night. And after the meeting, Evan asked the pastor, can I ask for anyone who wants to stay after and talk about spiritual awakening? He's like, sure, go for it. So he does. A few people stay after and and, and that meeting extends to about 10 p.m. It's kind of a glimmer of hope. But by no means is it a a waterfall of revival. But Evan Roberts 
knows that God has spoken to him. He's crossed a line and he is carrying an infatigable hope. November 4th, you know, we're three days later now. He does the same thing and that meeting goes till about midnight. And he goes, okay, this is, this is building. Like there's a growing anticipation. It's November 7th now and they gather again and he makes his first call towards salvation. And uh, first time for others to cross the line and 60 young people cross that line of salvation going, Evan, we're all in like you're all in. And now Evan's thinking, my gosh, this might be the beginnings. And that meeting goes till three in the morning. That's remarkable. Now this is not normal. This is an abnormal meeting and God is moving in a remarkable way. 60 salvations, people have crossed a line. They ended at 3 a.m. because of the zeal in their hearts for revival. And I would imagine Evan went to bed that night thinking, we are in revival. But he would wake up the next day. And this next day, November 8th, could have been the day that ended the movement. Could have been the day that made the uh, Welsh Revival no longer the Welsh Revival. It would have never happened, which would have led to so many other things not happening that we'll talk about. This could have been the end of everything. And I don't know about you, but I've woken up days after a profound encounter or an incredible meeting and questioned everything. Was that really as amazing as I thought? Is God really moving? Well, Evan woke up and with faith in his heart, infatigable hope, they met again that night. Only the meeting, it said, was cold and lifeless. And before long, everyone left the meeting with only Evan Roberts left in that church to cry out and go, God, you said revival. You promised it. You prophesied it. I've seen a down payment of it, and I will not give up. And he prays through the night till six in the morning that God would pour out his spirit. At the same time he's praying through the night, God is moving in the hearts of the community. And by 6 a.m., the whole town is awake and they have been struck with a conviction that they had left the meeting too early, that they were possibly missing out on something that God was doing. They're convicted of a little bit of lethargy, a little bit of apathy that still remains. Two days later, the headlines in the newspaper would say, the Welsh revival has begun. Two days after it could have all ended. Two days after a cold, lifeless meeting. Could you imagine if Evan Roberts had given up on his vision of hope? If he'd given up on the word of the Lord? Now, two days later, the newspapers are declaring it and Mariah Chapel is filled with over 800 people. They can't fit in the chapel. The hunger for God has struck the people and it would go all over the nation. Evan and his young band of revivalists would go to dozens and dozens of cities. Prayer meetings would spring up across the nation. Crime would become virtually non-existent. Prisons would be emptied. Sporting events were empty because people would have rather gathered and worship. Revival began to grip the whole nation. It was literally as if the heavens had been pulled back and God invaded Wales. It was truly transformational at every level. And get this, is that less than six months after that meeting in November, 100,000 people had come to salvation in Wales. And in the months to follow, even more would come to salvation. Evan Roberts' prayer had been answered. His infatigable hope had become a reality. And he and Flory Evans and many others, as they had crossed that line, had now become a consuming and raging fire that encompassed the whole nation. The fruit of it would touch the whole world. The fruit of it would lead to the Azusa Street Revival, but even far beyond that, it would spread across the earth as seeds of hope were scattered across the earth that God is on the move. So much so that today, the largest, expression of Protestant Christianity can be traced back to the Azusa Street Revival and the Welsh Revival. Over 500 million Christians trace their roots back to this moment, to this outpouring. Can you imagine if they had given up? Can you imagine if they had not pressed in on the word of the Lord? These 10 days marked all of human history. And many of us watching today are saved, set free, and filled with the Spirit of God because of the simple obedience, the infatigable hope, and the crossing of the line of these fearless leaders who led the way in the Welsh Revival.
Now, as we wrap this up, I want to give you a couple things, personal applications that we would really take to heart from this. Is number one, we've said it a bunch of times, but infatigable hope. What does that mean? Infatigable means un, it means tireless. It means it never grows weary. It means that hope is never sleeping inside of us. It means that our circumstances can't take it. It means that no cynicism can take it. It means that headlines can't steal it. It means that no matter what we see around us, we are living according to greater reality and that reality is the word of the Lord and the promises of God. God wants to fill us with infatigable hope. No matter your circumstances, no matter your family situation, no matter your financial situation, no matter your city situation or your national situation, no matter economics, no matter politics, God's word is more real, more steadfast than any of these things. And God wants to strike the body of Christ with a tireless, infatigable, never sleeping hope until that hope becomes the reality all around us. Number two, he's going to talk about the importance of crossing that line. We see it in Flory Evans' life. We see it in Evan Roberts' life. And then we see it in tens of thousands of Welsh people as they crossed a line into wholehearted Christianity. What does this mean? It means leaving our comforts behind. It means leaving our compromises behind. It means leaving unbelief behind. It means leaving everything behind. It means responding to Jesus' cry. If anyone would come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. This crossing of the line is a crossing into wholeheartedness. Faithfulness is always admirable, but I think there's something even more than faithfulness. There's being, there's, there's, there's being consumed with the love of God consumed with the word of God, consumed with the vision of God. And it's in our faithfulness and perseverance that God begins to consume us. Now is the time to cross the line. Now is the time to carry infatigable hope. Now is the time for great spiritual awakening across our nations. Now is the time that God wants to pull back the heavens and pour out His Spirit. Now is the hour of salvation. Now is the hour of global harvest. Now is the time of a billion soul harvest. Now is the time of the greatest missions movement in all of human history. And now is the time of the church rising up glorious, activated, missional, consumed, filled with infatigable hope as the solution to our cities, to our crisis, to our workplace, and to our society. The Welsh revival is an injection of hope, and it is a conviction that crossing the line will always eventually lead to the breakthrough. Now stay tuned in our next episode as we wrap this up because we're going to talk about the Azusa Street Revival. And it was a particular visitor from Los Angeles as well as a book from the Welsh Revival that land in the hands of a few faithful prayer warriors in Los Angeles, California that catalyzed that move of God. And that move of God, like the Welsh Revival, would scatter seeds of hope and seeds of revival all over the world. Stay tuned next episode for the Azusa Street Revival.